We are now the tabernacle. We are now the temple that houses your very presence. Father, I thank you that mercy and goodness is just not on us, but mercy and goodness is now in us. Thank you, Father, that your son rose, rose from the dead and resurrected. He didn't tap out. I just had this this week about, I was watching some MMA and when someone is in submissions and, and they're, they're starting to black out, they'll tap. And, and, and the match is over with and then Jesus didn't tap out. He stayed with it to the very end. With the dehydration, the pain, probably wanting him over. He stayed with it. This morning, we've been in prayer this morning and had an intercessory this morning as well. But we just want to invite you to pray with us. Um, we want to pray for the healthcare workers, those who are on the front lines with, with this, this virus thing. And I just believe God's going to hammer this thing and just enough's enough type thing. So before we get into the message this morning, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. We just unite together and we just agree that you can wipe a plague from a nation with just a move of your hand. And so, Father, we just pray in Jesus' name that this virus, your name is above that. And your name is going to squash this and hammer this thing down. That we speak against this virus. We speak life over people who are struggling with it. Father, we ask for a miraculous healing across our country. But there would be no way man would get credit and glory for this. But your hand would just move so mightily across this nation. So this nation can get back to being who she is. So Father, for those who are on the front lines, the healthcare workers, we thank you that Psalms 91 is the verse that shields them and guards them. That the blood of Jesus is still as powerful today. It's, the, it's the, what draws the line in the sand and says this is as far as it can go. So, Father, those who are on the front lines, we salute them, Father God. We raise them up and honor them. And we ask that your protective hand be on them. Father, we ask for wisdom and strength and power for our leaders to make good decisions based on this country. So, Father, we pray for those in leadership. We pray for our president. And his family, Father God, give him good information from good people as he can make wise and just decisions concerning the future of our country. Father, I thank you that your hand has been upon this nation. Father, we are not perfect. But as long as your hand is still on us, we can perform the works of the kingdom. So we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. We're, we're going to get into a message this morning, and we had several ideas and different directions we were going to go with, and so I, I just kind of narrowed it down to the resurrection, the abundant nature of God. And if you look at what the resurrection was, uh, it's a time of great pain and great sorrow. It's also a time of great victory, and uh, we just, as the body of Christ, those of us who are believers, look at the, the resurrection as being just a manifestation of God's love towards us. That Jesus didn't suffer everything he went through and do all the things that he did just for the sake of fulfilling prophecy, but it was all love-based. It was love-driven by the Father for Jesus to go through what he went through. And we're going to look at it from that viewpoint this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be going to Exodus chapter 34. 
Exodus chapter 34. We're going to key in on verse 6. And we're going to talk about the abundant nature of God this morning concerning uh, the resurrection day or Easter, depending on your theological bent, whichever way you like that. That's fine with me. But uh, this idea, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is a picture of the abundant nature of God. That if you look back in the Old Testament at all uh, through my, how God operated in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's an abundant God. I mean, notice he just doesn't things, do things just to barely get over. Everything he does is done in abundance. He lavishly loves us. He richly dwells the word within us. So there's always this God's more than enough thing. It's not just enough to get by. He does super and above everything that we can think or ask, right? So that's the picture of the resurrection. This was God not just barely getting us into heaven. This was everything heaven had to offer. That's good news for me. Okay, I'm like, oh, wow, God just didn't give me just a little bit. He gave me a whole lot, right? He didn't give me just enough forgiveness to keep me out of hell. Okay, he gave me a lot of forgiveness, more than just missing hell. He gave us that over and abundant thing that we needed for every area of our life. And we're going to get into that uh, this morning. So in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, I think I told you the right verse. It says, the Lord uh, passed by before him, that he was Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. I don't know about you, but looking back on my life, I can look back and see where there's been goodness of God has been abundant in my life. Not just enough to forgive me for that day, but for everything I did in the past, and the things I'll do now, and the things I will do in the future. It's an abundant goodness. And people have a distorted theology of God. They think that, well, God's good, except he will do this. God's good, but he will do that. that that's, 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 a, that's a distorted view of the theology of God. Either God's good or he's not. Right? There's no middle ground with this thing. God is a good God. He's a good father. He knows how to give good things to his children. So if that's true, then anything that's not good makes sense, right? It's not of him. So we have this wonderful, loving, abundant God because it's out of his nature to be that way. He's not trying to be good. He's not trying to be merciful. He just is. Okay? He's not trying to love me. He just loves me because that's his nature. It's in his essence. It's in his makeup just simply to love. That means I don't have to bring any works to the table to earn this thing. How many of you ever known someone who's tried to earn love? Right? It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a carrot on the end of the stick thing. I want love and I'm trying to pursue it, but I never can seem to get there. When God shows up, he says, I'm love. I'm the perfect picture of love. Here I am to you. See? And if he didn't feel that way, then why, why, would, why would he go through the cross thing and all that thing with Jesus coming and, and dying and, and going through the grave and the resurrection, if it wasn't love driven. At the root of all that experience this last week of, of Passover, what's the drive behind it? There was no obligation there, except the fact that if he wanted to turn mankind loose, he could have done it at the Garden of Eden. Is that not true? I mean, if you were going to be done with mankind, that would be the time to say, okay, boys, you're done. No, but what did he do? He spent the next thousand, several thousands of years getting things primed and ready for Jesus to come and do what he did. It was all love-driven. It was love-based, okay? Abundant. The word abundant here in the Hebrew in this verse means too much in quantity or quality and quantity, size or exceeding strong. So in other words, this abundant mercy is over the top mercy. It's not just enough to get you off of what you just did. See, we, we sometimes measure forgiveness on how much we think someone is sorry for what they did. Is that, you understand what I'm talking about? Someone did something small, we think they're really uh, contrite or repentant, so we give them mercy and grace. That's, that's not the way God works. When I miss it or I blow it, I get the abundant nature of God. Not just enough to get me, well, I won't, I won't send you to your room this time. 
you are, everybody can sit through the room, right? Okay? So this is the opposite of just enough. So if you look at this word in the Hebrew, this word here means more over the top, everything, but it's the opposite of just enough. It's not just a little bit of love or a little bit of mercy or grace. It's a whole bunch. And if you study out specifically the week that Jesus went through, you realize just how abundant this thing here really is. It's an abundant thing that God did for us, and now we get the chance to walk in. Let's go on to the next verse here. I want to do this in Isaiah 55, verse 7. It says, Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he, is, he will, what? Abundantly pardon. Okay? So there, now we have this uh, abundant pardon thing that God does with us. I have a whole boatload of stuff that I've been pardoned for. And so does everybody else, by the way. Okay? Mine seem to be a whole lot more than some people. Okay? Some people were born saved and they walked with God all their life. I not so much. I had a lot of years where I didn't do that. And now looking back, you think how much great mercy and great grace was involved in life-saving things he did, or I wouldn't be here. Amen. Okay? I thought I didn't see God's hand in, at the time, but looking back, you're thinking, wow. I, would, I, I just should not have made it through that and not be hurt, not be... That would, in other words, I did some stupid stuff. That's not the Greek or the Hebrew. That's just the way it is. I did some stupid things. So I got abundantly pardoned, not just for the sin, sins I did, but also for the ones that I were going to do. It's an abundant pardon, okay? Abundant here in the Hebrew, this word means this. It means to increase in authority more than enough or to enlarge. In other words, God forgives because he has the authority to do so. See, and, and to, 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 not to make a too fine a point of it, but I have the authority to forgive sin or not. See, if someone does something wrong to me, I can either retain those sins and hang on to them, or I can pronounce them forgiven and release them and let them go. So I have the authority to do that. I can either hang on to someone's sin and what they've done to me, and maybe they've mistreated me, betrayed me, and I can hang on to that offense. I have the right and the authority to do that. Or I can release that person in the love of the Lord and, 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 and remit that thing. It's no longer something I hold against them. Isn't that good news? I can do that. I've seen people walk around for years with stuff. Still, you, they'll remind you of the offense. They can tell you the day it happened. They can tell you the circumstance behind it. It's so vivid to them, that means they've not forgiven that sin, and they have the authority to release it. Okay? That makes sense, all right? So the word pardon simply means to forgive. I just, he, he just simply forgives us because it's in his authority to do so. So in Christ, he did what with his blood? He said, this is the blood that will forgive many sins. Right? There's over an abundance of his blood was going to take care of mankind. And for those who receive that blood, all the benefits that come with that. How many of those God's got benefits? Yeah. And they're good too, by the way. Okay? There's not one bad one in the bunch. Alright? So let's go a little further. When he ransomed us, he restored us. He just didn't forgive us and redeem us. He then restored us. Right? The word repentance R E means, to, means again, repentance is the root word, penthouse, it means the very top. So when I repent, guess what? He restores me to the very top or back into my rightful position. I don't have to go step through steps one, two, and three and go back to square one with him. I get to step back into the place that I fell from. Isn't that good news? Yeah. I mean, he's never had to earn their way back into someone's good graces. Isn't that a lot of fun? Okay? <laughs> the good thing with God is, is he says, okay, I've forgiven it, I've pardoned it, I've ransomed you, I've done everything. Now, guess what? You get to step back into sonship. The prodigal son's father did not lecture him when he returned home. How many of you have been lectured before? <laughs> okay. What he did is he restored him back to the house. He did not allow him to go into the slave quarters. He put him back in the house. 
I got to preach good there. That's fine, okay? <laughs> he put the ring back on his finger, the shoes back on his feet, the robe on him and said, Sonship, you're not going to have to earn your way back into my home. It's a great story, by the way. Okay, let's go on. Here's some of the benefits of, 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 of the of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The covenant that we have with Him. Let's look, let's just run through quickly some of the benefits. Number one, we get eternal life. How many knows that's a pretty good deal? Okay, you can't go to Walmart and get a better deal than that, right? Especially now. Okay, but eternal life. We get the whole package of now having the opportunity to spend eternity with God. You can't, we can't minimize that. We've not seen heaven. We've not seen the Father. We've not seen all those things, but we read in the Word of God and we see that we were in need of a Savior. And what we did is attached our faith to that and realized that we were a sinner, needed a Savior, and that marriage took place. And now heaven has been assured. Sight unseen. That's some great beach property somewhere, right? Okay, I now get this eternal life thing. So if I trust him with that, why don't I trust him in the day-to-day -day things? Same covenant. Salvation and eternity with him is the same part of the covenant that gets me through day-to-day. -day. So eternal life. Number two, okay, here's another one. Forgiveness of sin. Having sin remitted, washed away, taken care of, cast from the east to the west. All those things that we think about, but... We have to be able to walk in the understanding that there is forgiveness of sin. And we don't talk about sin too much in the church these days because sometimes that makes people feel uncomfortable. Right? Well, sin is uncomfortable. It may be pleasant for a moment, but it's that thing that stains me that the blood of Jesus will wash clean. Okay? I mean, that's what 1 John 1 9 says. If, he, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You cannot wear the verse out. Well, I've done this. Now. Okay? Forgiveness, repentance, and he, <laughs> asking God to forgive and wash those, those sins clean. But we have the forgiveness of sin. We, have, we also have righteousness that's been imputed to us. We have been made the righteousness of God. Isn't that good? So when I hear people say, I'm just a no good sinner saved by grace, I cringe because I'm thinking there's covenant that says I'm righteous. Do I always act righteous? No. Can I get into self-righteousness? Yes. But the, 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 the giving of righteousness that's been placed on you. You see, we've been transported, uh, transformed out of darkness into his marvelous light. Right? And the word light even gets an adjective. It's marvelous light. It's not just light. It's marvelous light. In that good place to be. Okay? So also we have righteousness. We have freedom from the curse. Man, that's the reason why Jesus had to die on the cross. He could not die in the streets. He could not die at the whipping post. He had to die on the cross. Why? Because cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. So that's the location he had to die from. It couldn't have been anywhere else. He was going to bleed out his last breath on that cross. That was where he was going. This is all good stuff. Another, we got adopted. In the covenant, the death, burial, and resurrection, we get adoption. And we don't have time to talk at all about adoption, how powerful that is. Amen? You can disown your kids, but you cannot disown an adopted child. Isn't that good news? I got adopted in. No, it's not good news. Wait a minute. <laughs> it sounded good when I said it, but no, it's not good to just on your kids. But I get adopted in. <laughs> I mean, we like to adopt uh, this on your kids. <laughs> the good news is, is that I got a father who says, I'll never turn you loose. <laughs> That's good news. You see? So in other words, where man's laws will come to, will come, come to the end, God's law says, I'm not going to turn you loose as a child. Adoption. Full rights, full privileges. In, in the Old Testament, it talks about this, where a slave, after he worked several years in, in his, his, his master's house, at the end of that six years, he could, had a choice of taking what he had, he had gained, his possessions, and, and go off and start his own family, or he could stay in the house. 
And the master will take him to the doorpost of the house and take him all and pierce his right ear and put a ring in his ear. Then he went from slavery to sonship. So if he went to the market before that time, he went on behalf of the master. But now with the ring in the ear, the right ear, he walks into the marketplace as a son, buying and selling on his own behalf. That's good stuff, okay? So we had this adoption thing going on. And what's sad is I think in our culture today, we have really a bunch of people who don't know that there's, there's a father who loves them. There's, a, there's just an orphan mentality in the culture today. So many of our cultural problems come from lack of fathers. Okay? We really do. There's a lot of social issues that people are dealing with because there wasn't that father to raise them. And we got to move on. I'm sorry. But this adoption thing is, is pretty powerful, right? Also, deliverance. We have received deliverance. That's what the word salvation mean, or means, right? It means rescue. It means to deliver in every area, not just one, but every area. So I have been delivered. I have deliverance available to me through this blood. Anger, fear, all these things that we, we, we need deliverance from, it's all wrapped up, tied up in the package that Jesus presented. Why would people argue over whether or not we have these things or not? It's weird to me. You talk to some people and you talk about the benefits or, or what's in the covenant of the resurrection and they will argue whether or not you got this or not. It doesn't make sense to me. Why would I deny what Christ paid for? Let's move on. Okay? Peace with God. Okay? This was huge. The peace offering had its own special offering in the Old Testament. There was a specific peace offering that you had to make the peace offering with God before you get a sin offering before you can go further in the offerings. Well, this is one of the great things about it was Jesus was our peace offering to make peace between us and God. That's been paid for. That peace has been taken care of. He's now at peace with me. Whew. How many of those people could use peace today, right? So if I have peace of God, I can have peace with God, and so I can walk this life out in peace. Seems very difficult during this time. The peace of God is supposed to go with me. Every place I put my foot, I can walk in the peace of God. It's part of the full armor, right? Part of the armor, okay? Indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And good, that's the reason why that mercy just doesn't follow me. Follow me. Now mercy is inside of me. It wasn't just something that goodness and mercy follow us. Now because of Christ being inside of us and the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, I now have the mercy and grace I need inside of me. Because when Jesus came, he brought mercy. He brought grace when he came. That's part of being at peace with God. My job is to repent and live sanctified. And I get the rest of it. How about that? A little further here. In 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his what? Abundant mercy. Okay? Caused us, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. An abundant mercy. Not just enough to get me through or to get me by. It's an abundant mercy. Why? Because that's all God knows how to do is give abundantly. It's an abundant. It wasn't just enough to save us. It wasn't just enough to get us through. It was over and the top, and it's over the top mercy and grace. Now, you didn't leave one thing undone. There's not one part of my life that's not covered by this blood. Finances, everything. It's all wrapped up, tied up in this covenant. What a deal. It's a great thing to honor God through all this because we know that he has provided so much for us and just lavished this on us. That's the reason why Thanksgiving should be such a huge part of, of, of what we do uh, every single day. Something about the Old Testament and the Passover if you study the Old Testament and the Passover, we know that Israel had fallen into slavery and had been in slavery somewhere around 400 years. So when Passover came, not only did it protect Israel from the death angel that was coming, but 
but it also was the, to break away from Egypt and launch them into their destiny. They were leaving that night. They were told how to dress, to have your staff and your, and your shoes on and your belt around you because we're getting out of here tonight. And it was a type and shadow of them leaving the world system and being moved forward. Well, at the cross, when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't just saying what I've done has been completed. I'm now launching you towards your destiny and your intended purpose. So it wasn't just the fact that we're leaving. We're getting that ready now to do the journey. So as powerful as that was in the Old Testament, that picture of the Passover, of that breaking those bonds with Egypt, that, that slavery thing that had allowed to creep in and take them over, well, we were slaves as well. And so when, the, when Jesus said, it's finished, he said, I've done everything possible for you now to move forward into the Father's will. So not only was it something that came to an end, that end result keeps coming back to me over and over and over again. It's powerful. I love it. That's some good stuff. Let's go on this a little further. Our forgiveness is bigger than we think. Our forgiveness is bigger than we think. I don't want to keep doing certain things wrong, wrong attitudes or, or, or those kinds of things. And we sometimes think we stretch the grace of God too thin. The Bible says what? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Abundance. So when I do sin, guess what? There's abundant grace. Not just enough where I don't spank you. <laughs> or I don't get, you don't get in trouble. No, here's a whole bunch of grace to go with that. Well, that just causes me not to want to do it again. Because why? That's so much love behind that grace. I don't want to in my father. I don't want to disobey my father. So through love, he pulls me to a stronger place of consecration because I love him and he loves me that much. See, we're not doing this because we have to. We get to do this because we want to. And this abundant nature of God just like, wow, I want that. I want to be a part of that that relationship so strongly that he's pulling me forward through his love and his grace. He's not standing there with his hands saying, okay, no, no more. You, you, you disobeyed me. You can't get any closer. How many ever had a father, a father say, get away from me. I don't want to see you right now. Okay? I don't know that I've ever said that. I don't think I have. Have I? Maybe? Yeah, close? But there's times, you know, your dad was so upset with you. It's like, go to your room. I don't want to see you. Get away from me. And in reality, it's the father pulling them close and saying, that was a disappointment. And maybe here's your discipline. So you love on the front end and you love on the, love on the back end. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where this stuff's coming from. You, know, <laughs> you love them, you spank them, you tell them you love them again, and then, and, and then you, you take it off the table. It's a done deal. We don't go back and visit that again. Because it's done. And there's been times with your children where there'll be contriteness and they're sorry, and, and they're, you can tell there's a sorrowful thing that's, that's happened inside them. So then why would you spank them? Because the brokenness has already come. Isn't that neat? Isn't it neat to have children you don't have to spank? Wouldn't that be awesome, right? But you're looking for the broken heart, you're looking for the contriteness, right? You're looking for that, that, that sorrow that says, I'm going to do my best it's not, not to do this again. And so as a parent, it's like, God's already done the work in me. I don't have to. Why pile more discipline on someone who's already... Mm. Living like we are fully pardoned brings the Father honor. It's nice that we honor fathers on Mother's Day, or mothers on Mother's Day, fathers on Father's Day, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. We should do that, but... One of the ways I can honor my dad is to walk in the principles that he taught me. Now, if you've been raised by a father who said, you know, work hard, love your family, love God, you're honest, you're trustworthy, those kinds of things. And the best way to honor your natural father is to continue on with those teachings and to, to walk in those things. That's an honor. That's an honor to your natural father. Well, one of the ways we honor what God's done is just to be the fully pardoned person that we are every single day. There's nothing wrong with celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but if I really want to honor that, I'll do that every day. Come on. See, 
For me not to live in something that Jesus paid for is not honoring him. Right. Am I, am I, are we on the same page? When I walk in what he told me I can walk in, guess who's getting the honor for that? And that, that's, that was something I wrote down this week. I thought, wow, if I want to honor God with a lifestyle, I live every day that brings him honor, not just once a year. We understand that uh, Easter is one of the high volume Sundays for churches because people come, you know, on Easter, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if I truly want to honor from the place of sonship and the place of adoption, I honor my father every single day by the way I treat people, by the way I respond to people, by what they see through me. It's because this is what my father has created and, and, and molded me into. And he gets the glory and the honor for that. His full pardon of us is based upon the finished work of Christ and his authority to do so. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that we understand the resurrection, not just the death and the burial, because we get the fact that, let's put it this way. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say, take up, take up my teaching mantle or my whatever. He called it a cross. And since we see what a cross is, it's a place of surrender, it's a place of dying to self. But everything I allow God to, 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 uh, to crucify in me, I get to resurrect the new life. If I die to self in pride, I get resurrected in more of a Christ likeness. What a trade off. It's not just me dying to self all the time, I get resurrected in that area. I become fully alive unto God in the area of the resurrection of Christ. We sometimes think we're giving up the hard stuff. I, I heard this story, and I, I've shared this once or twice somewhere. I don't think it was here. There was a story of a father and his, his daughter. She was, I think, 12, 13 years old. They were driving down the interstate. And they had just come from a funeral, and the 12-year-old was asking, Daddy, what about death? What happens at death? I thought this was so cool. He was thinking about some way to explain it to his 12-year-old daughter where she would understand this thing that Jesus took our, 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 our place on the cross and, and things like that. And it just so happens they were passing a, a semi-trailer. And as they, they drove past it, they drove from in the sun into the shadow of that trailer. And it just, this minister said, which would you rather be hit with, that truck or the shadow? And she said, well, I think that the shadow wouldn't hurt. So there you are. Jesus took the truck, so I get the shadow. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a story. What a teaching moment on that Jesus took the truck, the full force of it, the full blood of it. And all we get is the shadow. We don't have to take the truck. That's good news. That's pretty cool. So this morning, as we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, there's just so much to be thankful for. And there's so much in this week leading up to the, the, to the resurrection that would just take so long to pull out all the details. I just think we should walk in as much of the fully resurrected Christ as we possibly can. And when people tell me I can't have this and I can't have that, I said, my father said I could. It's in his word. He told me I could have peace. He told me I could have joy. He told me I could have authority. So it's not even worth arguing anymore because God's word says I can have it. So am I going to believe you or am I going to believe God's word? Right? Praise God. Let's pray this, uh, this morning in closing, and we're also going to pray for our prayer requests. We have our book here, and uh, we've, had some, we've had some names in here. We're not going to call them out publicly, so, but we are going to pray. we got some people who have had a um, few health issues, and we've already prayed for, for the nurses, doctors, those who are on the front lines, health care providers, anyone who's dealing with people. Uh, we have a note for... Uh, Bishop Shatika is in, out of his country in Nairobi. 
and cannot get back home, but his daughter is set to go in his way. So Bishop Shatika needs to go home, right? So we're going to pray for that. So let's, let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, those who are on this list, you know the names here, so we just unite together in faith and in prayer and unity that, Father God, your hand is not short concerning your promises and your ear is not dull of hearing. So, Father, we speak these requests out before you. And, Father, every situation where healing needs to take place, Father, we ask that healing begin to go. Begin to do a powerful work. Minister life to those who need ministering to. Father, for those situations, for Bishop, Father, we ask he would find favor and have permission to go back home to his daughter. That you would just open up avenues for him to be able to walk through it, Father. Father, as a nation, we repent. We call upon your name and we ask that you heal our land. For every family that's watching at home, we just come together in unity and, and, and faith. I believe that our prayers will accomplish what your word says it can do. Father, we give you honor and we give you praise. We thank you so much for the cross. What seemingly was defeat was actually the victory. So we honor you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are now the one living inside of us. We just give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.